Okay, this is uh, micro lecture number nine for the uh, uh, the twenty second of September today, um, and I didn't put it up the day before, but uh, here it is. Um, so uh, if we look at the syllabus, let me just shrink this down a little bit, uh, maybe even a little bit more. Okay, and oh, sorry, I need something to move this. Okay, so here's the syllabus, and you can see uh, on the 23rd, uh, 22nd rather, uh, the lecture is about GPIO ports, pull-ups, current limiting bit manipulation. And uh, I don't know, I may not do the demo. We'll see if we have time for that. Um, but I will do the demo on uh, on, on Thursday. I'll uh, do the lab, and um, I'll try and uh, demo uh, parts for the lab. The lab this week is going to be uh, in C. That'll be the first time that the lab's in C. So it's uh, it, it, I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, okay. So let me let me get rid of this. I'll uh, do this. And then I'll see if I can bring back the this. And I'll maybe position it up here. We'll see. Okay. Something like that. Maybe I'll do it like that. Okay. There we go. Okay. Uh, let me, I think I'm going to shut that door. All right, so GPIO, this is a super important topic for microprocessors and embedded controllers because the vast majority of, our, of the pins of our chip are, are used for GPIO purposes. And it, it also turns out that uh, GPIO pins can do an incredibly uh, large number of things without any additional you know, things attached to them. Uh, so... Um, they can even, uh, it, by changing levels, uh, by changing the, 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 the levels that's, that are set in the level register from uh, TTL to uh, Smith trigger, you can actually get a little bit of a, uh, you can almost get a little bit of an A to D effect. Um, so, so GPIO pins are, are very, very powerful and super useful. Um, one of the interesting uses that, that uh, I experienced was... Uh, you can uh, you can use them as an input, and you can definitely uh, tell the difference when uh, when a pin uh, is covered in ice and when it isn't. Uh, you can also use your A to D converter as an input too, uh, if you want to be a little more specific. Um, but you can also have the, uh, within the ice you can have another pin that's sending out a one, and then a different pin that's uh, that's uh, set for input. And, and you, when the ice covers both pins, you'll definitely get a different signal than when the ice doesn't cover both pins. Uh, or you can use it for a liquid sensor when the liquid covers both pins. If there's uh, any ability of the liquid to conduct at all, you'll definitely uh, detect the difference, even just using GPIO and not using uh, A to D. All right, so there's lots of, lots of powerful features. It's really important to understand how these pins are implemented because uh, that'll make a difference on your ability to use them wisely and to come up with your own novel uses. So um, on, on our PIC chip, um, the only pins that cannot be used as GPIO are VCC and ground. Now, uh, there's a little caveat on that, and that caveat is that we are using uh, three pins for, for the, the in-serial serial programming and debugger header. So your snap is sucking up three of the pins. And uh, you could still uh, program it with the snap, then disconnect the snap, and then uh, use jumpers or depending on how you have them set up, then the program could run on its own and, and still use those pins uh, however you wanted to. Um, you just, uh, you're just restricted in what can be directly connected to them while you're programming and, and using debug. But because we're going to program many different applications on the Viva board while you're uh, in this course, uh, you probably should uh, avoid using those pins. And of course, those pins are RA0, so port A, pin 0, port A, pin 1, and port A, pin 3, which is the master clear pin. Um, so 
those pins are pretty much set for those specific functions, and they're really not available for GPIO functions uh, if you're going to be able to use the debug feature. Now, interestingly, uh, you know when you set up uh, when you set up your um, uh, your programs, uh, hopefully you remember that uh, that there's a one of the options is uh, it, it says are you using a header with this chip, and what that's about. Uh, although we really hadn't explained it yet, that is that is a special chip that uh, works just like the uh, 1829, but it has additional pins uh, brought out of the die and it's packaged in a slightly bigger package to allow you to uh, to have the programmer debugger hooked up with the extra added pins and still have the regular RA0, RA1, and RA3 pins available for use. Now there is there is a limit on the RA3 pin. The RA3 pin uh, is normally just used for master clear. If you want to use it as a GPIO pin, you can use it as an input but you cannot use it as an output. It has no output uh, functionality. Um, so every pin has uh, six registers associated, or every port. There's three ports, and they all have three registers, which cover every pin in the port. Now, not all, pin, not all bits in that port are implemented. As you know, in port A, we only have uh, up to RA5, so six and seven are not implemented. And in port B, uh, 0, 1, 2, and 3 are not implemented, so we only have four pins that are implemented in port B. In port C, all seven are implemented, and they, and all seven of those can be used. Um, the three main registers, which you've already used, are the TRIS register, which sets essentially the data direction, the port register that is used to read inputs, and the latch register, which is used to write outputs. There are three other registers. One of them is the analog select, which we've also used, and that is to turn turn off analog function and turn on digital function on any particular pin. Now, for outputs, it doesn't make too much difference, uh, but for inputs, it's absolutely essential. If there is an, an analog select bit, you must change it. To, you must clear it to zero, and it will by default be a set as a one. So you must clear it in order to use that pin as a GPIO input. Otherwise, it will not work. Um, if you want to use it as an analog input, then you have to leave it in its default setting, or you have to set it to a 1 if it's already been changed. Again, there are there are 12. So all totaled out of 20 pins, 18 are available for GPIO. Uh, and of those 18, 12 of them have analog functions. Uh, but, so that means that there are six that don't have an analog function. And uh, one of those happens to be uh, RB7, another one happens to be RA5. Uh, and they're kind of scattered around. But it doesn't really matter. You should still just assume there is an analog function and clear that bit. Because if you port your program to another chip uh, that's very similar but has slightly different analog features, you might, uh, you might be, you might take a long time to figure out why your uh, why your inputs aren't working. Okay, and then we have two other registers that we haven't used. One is the WPU A, WPU B, WPU C. Those are the weak pull up, and you 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 enable weak pull ups on uh, particular pins for each port in these registers. And then in the uh, I think it's the Intcon register, or maybe it's the uh, option register, that's where you turn them on or off. Uh, and you turn them all on or off there. But this determines which pins have them actually applied. Uh, and I think the the defaults are kind of weird. They're not all the same. Some ports have them turned on by default and some ports have them turned off by default. And then our input level controls, they're also a little weird. Some are set for Schmidt trigger and some aren't. Uh, they're not entirely uh, the, the defaults on these aren't entirely obvious either. Uh, this really doesn't matter if you're just uh, if, if in most cases, but there could be a case where you're interfacing to a lower voltage device. Say you're running your chip at 5 volts and you want to interface to a device running at 3.3 volts uh, and you want to be able to, to read inputs correctly. Uh, or maybe not 3.3. I think they're, you know, all of them will work correctly. But if you, if you 
say that's running at 1.8 volts, uh, then this might be very important. So you have to kind of look at this. Sometimes in situations like that, you just have to get a translator uh, chip that switches the levels, and those are available. But uh, sometimes uh, your PIC chip can, can handle it. You, just, you might need to mess with the input level control, though. Um, and that's, that's the level at which it declares an a, a, a input to be a 1 uh, or not. And, uh, yeah. Okay. So this diagram we're going to spend a little bit of time on. Uh, this, is, uh, this was the, uh, the 1825. It's also described in the data sheet. Uh, when I first started doing this course, we did use the 1825. And then we stepped up to the 1829 because it has a, a port B as well, which uh, we don't have on the 1825. So it's, it's basically the same except no port B. Uh, and fewer pins. Uh, but here's, here is a, a, a good picture of the GPIO port right here. And uh, so we're going to spend some time on this. Maybe I'll move my face around down here. Um, so I definitely want you to really uh, study this diagram. It's in the data sheet uh, in, under Chapter 12, Figure 1, as you can see there. And uh, what this shows is uh, the, the, it's sort of the generic I.O. port operation. Uh, it, it pretty much it, it does leave out a few details, but, but a lot of the details are here. And so uh, it's really good to go through this. And this really should help you understand uh, how, the, how the port works. There's one other consideration that, that you probably do need to understand, and that is that uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expand myself here a little bit. And that is that um, that the way the processor works when it when it whenever it uh, writes a port, it it does what's called read modify write. So it actually does read uh, it does read the the bits, and then it modifies the bits that are supposed to be changed, and then it writes them all back out. Now this this read modify write can get you into trouble when you use the port uh, register for writing bits. Uh, if you use the latch register, it shouldn't, it should keep you out of trouble. But if you use the port register, it, it can get you into trouble. And, and I'll try and explain the reason for that. When you use the, when you use the, the, the latch instruction, well, so notice here, so here, this little X box is the actual pin. That's the physical pin that's connected to the outside world. And then you have these protection diodes that are reverse biased. Uh, which if you drive the pin too high or too low, these diodes will tend to protect the chip up to a point. Uh, obviously, at some point, they, you know, you, you can, if you put 1,000 volts on here, you're going to blow your chip, clearly. But, but if you exceed 5.5 uh, a little bit, you'll probably be okay. Uh, if you short the, 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 the pin out, uh, it'll, it'll also uh, give you a little protection. So these protection diodes uh, are just that. They're, they're to help protect the inside of the chip. Uh, if you get a weird voltage put on here. Um, so you notice there are a couple of things connected to the pin. One thing is this tri-state buffer is connected to the pin right here. And the other thing is the input to this AND gate is connected to the pin. Now the other connection to this AND gate comes from the AND cell bit. Now it probably should have a bubble on here, but uh, what what happens here is, uh, and the analog features aren't really shown. This is just the digital. Uh, but when the AND cell bit is 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 set, uh, then it turns off this AND gate, and that's why when you use it for digital purposes, you you cannot read anything on this pin because this AND gate is deactivated, and it and the analog functions come in before the AND gate. Uh, they should put, they should have put a bubble on here because when the ANSEL bit is an X uh, when the ANSEL bit is a one, it actually turns off the AND gate and when it's a zero it turns it on, so you have to make that this input has to be, uh, well effectively a one but it goes through an inverter so that this AND gate is turned on, and that way the input can get through this AND gate and and then be gated through this tri-state buffer onto the data bus. Here's the tri-state buffer, and this 
tri-state buffer is gated when you read the port command. That turns it this buffer on uh, and lets you read the pin, assuming your ANSEL bit is not blocking it. On the other hand, when you when you write the port, you're actually writing this flip-flop. You're writing, you're you're putting the bit you put in this position will go to the D input of this flip-flop. And when the clock clocks it in, this flip-flop then will reflect what you write. And that's true when you write the port command, it's also true when you write the latch command. Now when you read the latch command, it it activates this tri-state buffer here, which basically gates the output of your flip-flop onto the bus, onto the data bus. So when you read the latch, you're reading what's in the flip-flop. When you read the port, you're reading what's coming in on the pin, again, assuming your ANSEL bit is set correctly. When you, when you uh, change the TRIS bit, if the TRIS bit is set to a, a zero, then this tri-state buffer is active. And the Q is then output on the pin. So whatever the flip-flop is set at, the pin should reflect. It should come out on the pin. And, uh, and, and that's, that's basically how this GPIO port uh, changes, changes whether it's an input or an, input or an output. So, it's, so it, it changes that simply by connecting or disconnecting the flip-flop to the pin. So you can see why the ANSEL bit doesn't really reflect the output. Uh, not reflect, it doesn't affect the output. So, so that's, that hopefully would explain that. Okay, so, so when, you, when you're outputting uh, Q onto the pin, if you read the port, you should read what, uh, what that Q out is. However, if your ANSEL bit's not set correctly, you won't read that. That will not read correctly. And so this is where you can get into trouble. Uh, if the ANSEL bit is not set for digital function, you can still output whatever's on the flip-flop. But if you use the port command and you do a read modify write, uh, it will read all the bits in that port. So like in a port A, it'll read all, 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 uh, uh, all six bits uh, that are implemented and then it will write all six bits back out. Well, it's possible that a, one of the bits you're not really interested in, as it gets read, because you don't have the ANSEL bit set correctly, may actually misread, and then when it's written back out, you'll change it accidentally to something you didn't want. But not because that's the actual bit you're messing with, but because you're affecting a different bit. Uh, and that's the, that's the pitfall of read, modify, write. So you do have to be careful with read, modify, write. So when you want to write a bit to a, uh, to a port, you should always use the latch because the latch will read the flip-flop and that should read correctly what's been written before. Now the TRIS register could still be off, so that would not necessarily be appearing on the pin, but uh, but at least you'll, you'll read what's on the flip-flop and you'll write it back to the flip-flop and it should be the same. But if you use the port command, you'll read what's actually on the pin and then you write it back to the, to the flip-flop, which could change things. So you do have to keep this in mind. Okay, um, so hopefully you should look at this, you should stare at this for a good while and just think your way through it. So let me just review the important detail. So this is the data bus where the information goes, uh, well, it's bi-directional. So, so when you write, the data comes on the data bus this way. When you read, it goes on the data bus that way. When you write the, the latch, you're writing the D input on the flip-flop. When you read the latch, you're reading the output up from the flip-flop through this tri-state buffer that turns on when you read the latch. When you write the port, you're writing the flip-flop. When you read the port, you're turning on this tri-state buffer, which gates what's whatever's coming through this AND gate, which if the ANSO bit's not set correctly, will, will, will be bogus. It, it, will, it will read, I, I don't know what it reads. I guess it reads a zero, but it, 
but it, it certainly won't read what's on the pin. When you, when you make the pin an output, the TRIS bit turns on this tri-state buffer so that the output of the flip-flop is directly connected to the pin. When you make it an input, you turn off this flip-flop so the tri-state buffer disconnects the flip-flop from the pin. Okay, and that the port reads, reads the pin and writes the, writes the flip-flop. The latch reads and writes the flip-flop. Okay, so that's, that's pretty good, I think, in terms of going through this. So uh, when we do a help session, if you have questions about this, you should write them down and we should talk because uh, everybody really does need to understand this. And I will, some of the test questions, uh, not, not, the pro, not the programming test, but some of the upcoming tests will definitely deal with this. Okay. So, so let's talk about pull-ups, input levels, current sync and source, interrupt capability, a minimum high and low voltage, uh, which of course does depend on this uh, input level register setting for that pin. So, uh, so pull-ups and input levels. So the, so, so the weak pull-ups uh, provided on this chip are not super useful in my view, and uh, I have, I have, uh, I've tried to use them um, in a number of applications and and really had them be slow enough that they didn't. They just don't work, apparently. I don't know. They're just so weak. They're probably mega ohms, and they're, they're just not strong enough to, to really pull the pin up uh, enough that it, that it actually really works. So I think it's fair to say that the main purpose of the, of the internal pull-ups, the internal weak pull-ups, is, uh, is to avoid having floating inputs. So if you have pins set as inputs, then all you have to do is you just uh, you just turn the input, and you're not going to use those pins for anything. Then turn on the weak pull-ups so that you uh, keep them from floating, which could uh, could could be a source of noise uh, injected into your microprocessor. So so it's probably good to not have any pins that are disconnected uh, sit there without the weak pull-ups turned on. Um, current sync and source capability. So. For for each pin, the 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 data sheet talks about 25 milliamps sync and 25 milliamps source. So any particular pin can uh, can ground up to 25 milliamps, and any particular pin can provide up to 25 milliamps uh, as a as a positive output. However, the there is a budget for the whole chip, and so you have to look at the data sheet. And we probably should bring up the data sheet and and look at that. Uh, let's see. I don't have it brought up right now. Oh well, let's see. Uh, I don't think I do. Uh, let me just check. I'm pretty sure I don't. No. Okay. So let me let me bring it up. So I'm gonna turn off the slides right now, and I'm gonna have to get move this and this, and then the data sheets right here. Now, so if we to get the these uh, these values, we have to go all the way down to the electrical specifications, and uh, so uh, so 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 remember we said that that uh, that maximum current output sunk by any IP, I, IO pin twenty five milliamps, maximum output current sourced by any IO pin twenty five milliamps. So so this these tell you, these tell you, the the maximum that you can sync and source. However, there's a budget for the whole chip. So, and here's uh, so basically, uh, so if you have the uh, so it depends on whether you you have the 85 degree version or the 125 degree version. Um, so that's a little different, uh, but we have the industrial version, so it's 80 milliamps. So you can you can so if you here on the maximum output uh, output current sourced 25 milliamps. If you had uh, three pins sourcing 25 milliamps, you'd, you'd be already up to 75 milliamps, assuming that that was the only current. And of course, the chip takes a little bit of current anyway, so you'd probably be over 
the maximum. Now, uh, it turns out these, these chips will take a fair amount of abuse, uh, but it's just not a good idea to try and run them like that for, for, you know, for very long periods of time because it is going to shorten their life, clearly. Um, and then notice this, and this is kind of interesting, that, that, the, uh, that the maximum current that you can, uh, that you can uh, so sink out of the ground pin is, is a little more. It's 85 milliamps. So that's one of the reasons why we often like to sort we like to sink current more than we like to source current. And there are micros that have a, a, a bigger budget for what they can sink than what they can source. In this case, uh, it's only five milliamps more, so it's not that big a deal. Um, but it is uh, it's yeah. Um, and then the, the the power dissipation is a fairly complicated calculation. Uh, and uh, you can you can only dissipate about 800 milliwatts. Um, so let's see. Um, so you can only go. So theoretically, you should only go to minus 0.3 volts and to plus 0.65 volts uh, without running the potential of, of destroying your chip. Uh, and then in the, the low the low voltage the low power version is only up to four, but this this chip can't run is not supposed to be run over 3.3. .3. Uh, and then there's a special a specific rating on the master clear pin. Um, so anyway, so so there's a so there's a, uh, some of the requirements here. Um, okay, and then we have. Um, then there's some other considerations here. One of them is that if you want to run the chip at its maximum frequency at 32 megahertz, you have to be above 2.5 volts. So uh, it'll run at 1.8 volts, uh, but only up to 16 megahertz. And then if you want to do 32, you have to be at least 2.5 volts. Of course, it, at 3.3 and 5 volts, it'll run at any, at any of the frequencies, so that's fine. Um, same thing, and this is the LF chip. I guess it'll run up to 3.6, yeah. All right, so anyway, um, and then here's the uh, the frequency accuracy of your internal oscillator, and it it uh, it changes a little bit with temperature, as you can see. That's the ambient temperature. So here's the one we've looked at before. Um, let's see. Um, well, no, I want the one that where we took where we see the uh, the actual. Um, uh, yeah, not these. Uh, these are, those are the if you have an external oscillator, external crystal. Uh, and not this. Not that. Yeah. And this is the one we have looked at this before. Uh, this this tells you uh, what the, your input level uh, control does. So when you change your input level, you you either select for a TTL or a SMIT trigger. Now there's a couple of other uh, weird ducks. When you're using I2C, you have some different levels, and if you're using it as an uh, as an SM bus, you have some different levels. The SM bus is much like the I2C. Uh, we're not going to do that, although it's uh, it is a, a consideration. All right. So anyway, uh, so with TTL, you can see uh, if you want to see what it has to do for a, to detect a low voltage, and and I've we've already been through this before, so I'm not going to do it all again. But for input low and input high, and you can see uh, you have to do a little calculation depending on where you're running your chip. So if you're running at 3.3, you have to do a little calculation, uh, and and it's not a bad idea to do that, and you might find when you're interfacing to certain devices that you might have to go into Schmidt trigger mode. So if, if your chip is not correctly recognizing inputs coming from an external device operating at a slightly different voltage, then you may have to do this calculation to, to sort out what to do to fix it. Whether you can just change the input level and get it to work that way, or whether you're going to have to get a translator. Um, all right. And 
uh, yeah, you can see the weak pull-ups are down in the microamp range. They, that's why they don't really do much. Okay, I think that's really all I wanted to do. So let's go back to the slides. Okay. Okay, there we go. And yeah, so so um, so you can see that your minimum your minimum high and low voltages uh, do depend on your input level register settings. So again, just keep that in the back of your mind. And if, then if you know at some point you're in, interfacing a microprocessor, you may uh, you may realize most of them have these a register that controls these things on most pins. Not all of them, but most of them do. So it might be something you have to deal with. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, using a transistor as a switch. This is, this is, uh, we'll hopefully be able to do this lab. Um, we, you already have built into your Viva board a, a transistor switch, but the one that's on your board is a little fancier than a single, um, uh, BJT. It's, it uses two BJTs. It uses a 3904 and a 3906. One's an MPN and one's a PNP. And it has them set up so that you're pretty well guaranteed of driving uh, the, the actual switching transistor into uh, total saturation to turn it on. Uh, if you don't have uh, a little, if you don't have that two transistor arrangement, then you have to do, you have to spend a little more time uh, making sure that the resistor in the base circuit is appropriately sized and you have to be careful uh, you do have to have a, a resistor in that circuit and it must be it must cause enough current to be drawn to uh, fully turn on the transistor if it's only partially turned on then it really won't work and it often will get hot uh, so you definitely need to, to, to do that so that's why a two transistor uh, arrangement is 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 better because you, you have a little more forgiveness because you use the first transistor to, uh, to, drive, to, to drive the base and to, and to pull enough current uh, uh, um, through the base, either into or out of the base, to make it work. Now, but if you're using a single transistor, there are a couple of things to keep in mind, and one of them is that there's sort of a good way and a bad way to do it. Generally, if you're sw let here's your load. And here's your power supply up here. Now, in most cases, we would like to switch the, the high side leg. And we normally keep the load connected to its ground connection. And we just switch the high side. We, we prefer that. We, we'd rather do that just for a lot of safety reasons and, and other considerations. Now, with BJTs, the, the power loss in any BJT is pretty much the same for an MPN and a PNP. But this is not true when we get into FETs. And, uh, and so when you're, doing a, when you're using a power FET, a lot of times you want to use an N-channel FET, but you want to switch the high side. And that causes some problems uh, because you have to take, uh, you have to take the, the drain significantly above the source in order to make that work. And the source is usually at the maximum voltage your system has. And so you have no source of voltage to do that. And you may be switching 24 volts with a, and trying to use your microprocessor to do that. And, and you need to take the, the you need to take the uh, the gate uh, above 24 volts, maybe even seven or eight volts above that. Uh, and so, how do you do that with the micro? And so there there are ways to do that. Uh, but uh, but anyway, with the BJT, we don't have that problem. So you so you normally would use an MPN in the high side, and or, sorry, you normally use a PNP in the high side to switch the high side. So here's a PNP. What what you don't want to do is use an MPN. And the reason you don't want to do that is because uh, in, with the PNP, your, your, your calculations for your, uh, for your uh, emitter base current only depend uh, on this resistor and your, and your voltage here and your VN here. Whereas here, it also varies based on your load because the current uh, for, a P, for an MPN you're pushing current into the base, and it also is going to flow through the load to ground. So when the MPN's in the high side, now if you flip this situation and you put the MPN in the low side, that's fine. This works just fine uh, because now 
uh, your current does not run through the load that you push into the base because it's on the other side. Uh, but again, we normally don't like to switch the low side. We normally like to switch the high side. Uh, although in some situations it doesn't really matter, especially if you're dealing with real low voltage devices. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and in this case, you wouldn't want to use a PNP to switch the low side. You'd want to use an MPN. And for the same reason here, the current does run through the load first and, it, and then through the base resistor. So you have, you complicate your calculations for your, your, your emitter base current. Whereas here, your emitter base current strictly depends on this resistor and your transistor. Whereas the, uh, in this case, it depends also on the load. All right, so hopefully you can keep that in mind. Um, so... <clears throat> So like we said, uh, and hopefully you've, you've gotten, get this in your medical devices, um, that for the PMP, you need to pull current out of the base to turn it on, uh, and it's better for switching the high side. Base has to be more negative than the emitter. And for the MPN, current's pushed into the base to turn it on, and it's better for switching the negative leg of the load and the base has to be more positive than the emitter in order to turn it on. All right, um, <clears throat> yeah, so let's say you, one of your pins, so you know your pin on your micro can only control 25 milliamps. Well, so what if you want, need to control something that's gonna pull more current? Well, now you have to, now you have to use a device. You have to use something like a BJT or a FET in order to switch things because um, <clears throat> your micro pin will, will burn out and you'll destroy your chip if you try and use it to supply more current than that. Um, you can get up to t maybe 200 milliamps, realistically maybe 150 milliamps with the, with the, uh, with the 39, 2N3904, 2N3906 uh, BJTs, and, th and that's what's on your board. Um, so you've got probably 150 milliamps you can safely use. Uh, once you get above that, you, uh, it's going to be a little bit worse. And uh, we have had uh, students uh, blow those chips. <laughs> not, not their microprocessor, but the 3904, the 3906 on that board. Uh, it, it only burns, uh, I think it burns the PMP chip, uh, which I think is, I, I'm, I always forget which one's which. Uh, I think it's the 06. That's the PMP. That's the one that, that blows. Um, you can also use more powerful BJTs uh, to get up to uh, you know higher currents, but the truth is, uh, it, if you're going to control something with more current than that, then you probably want to you probably want to use a, uh, a FET instead. Um, this can also dramatically increase your fan out for a pin uh, to, to drive a, a BJT instead, and uh, of course it provides a little extra protection to the micro pin. These are super cheap and they're small. Uh, <clears throat> you can see how big they are. If you look at your board and you look over there in the, the area where your two transistor uh, switch is set up, uh, right under your female two pin connector, uh, you can see they're, they're quite small. Um, <clears throat> all right. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> let's see. So, I think, yeah, so we'll, what I'll do. Um, so let me, I think at this point, so I think what we'll do now at this point is we will um, um, switch to the uh, to the little thing where I can draw on it and um, hopefully uh, uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, kind of the test coming up. It's not till the 29th. Um, I still haven't figured out exactly how to work it to be done online. So I'm working on that, but uh, <clears throat> so as soon as I figure that out, I'll let you know. Um, <clears throat> but I can tell you what's going to be on it, and what's going to be. Uh, actually, I see it. What I want to do. I want to switch this. Uh, and so I'll switch this up. I know there's a way to, uh, I have to get it sequenced, uh, but anyway, um, so I'm going to make this big, but then I'm going to switch the camera. And then, oh, well, unbelievable. Uh, 
I swear. Well, okay, so I think what I'll do then, in lieu of this, uh, I will uh, I'll just do some, I'll just work on paper. All right, so, <clears throat> so we've kind of been through this before, but let me just, uh, let's just talk about it again. So for the programming test, so there are going to be there are going to be four things I want to I want to want to talk about, and uh, so first off, one. We're going to uh, I'll give you something. Um, uh, I'm going to have you set up the, the 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 assembly language for loop. And so remember the key to that is that dec decrement f skip on zero instruction. So make sure you make sure you're familiar with how this works. And basically, you have a variable. Let's call it x, and you always want to leave the result in f. So we're going to put the second single bit operand there, f. And f has to be preloaded with your count value, your index value. So uh, so when we talk about a for loop, we we have an index of the for loop. And I think somebody asked, what does the index mean? Well, that's what index means. It's a you, you're, you're counting your time. So you go through the loop the first time your index is, uh, in the case of this decrement, we're going to start at 10. So you go through it the first time your index is 10. You get to the end and it decreases, it subtract, it decrements it, and now it's 9. You go through it the second time, it's 9. You get to the end, it decrements it, so now it's 8. Now you go through it the third time, it's 8. You decrement it, now it's 7. You go through it the fourth time, and it's 7. At the end, it gets changed to six. You go through it the fifth time, and it gets decremented to five. You go through it the sixth time, it's decremented to four. You go through it the seventh time, it's decremented to three. You go through it the eighth time, it's decremented to two. You go through it the ninth time, and it's decremented to one. And you go through it the tenth time, it decrements to zero. And when it decrements to zero, it skips the following instruction. So the easy way to set this up is to make the following instruction the branch back to the top of your loop. And when it skips that instruction, it goes on to the next code in your program, whatever that happens to be, after the for loop. Now the only tricky thing is, before you can do this, you have to make sure that x has been pre-set up with your count value, in this case, say 10. You have to preload x with 10 before you enter this loop. But once you're in the loop, this decrement f skip on 0, with a following instruction to branch back to the top of the loop will basically work just like a for loop. Now you have to remember a couple things. One of those is that, is that, uh, that our locations in assembly language, uh, all of our variables are basically single 8-bit locations. And so uh, in C, our, we have 16 bits for our integers, and you can have a long that's bigger. And so 16 bits gives you 65,000. But 8 bits only gives you a maximum of 255. So, so you, can, you, can, you can use the decrement F skip on 0 to do 255 times to the loop, but not any more than that. Um, OK, so that's the first thing. And, and obviously, this loop then has a couple of features. One is you have to, you have to, you have to, to initialize initialize x okay and so how do we do that well so we whenever we want to put a constant in a memory location we we just use we just use the uh, uh, we want to use one of the literal instructions move literal to w and the literal then is better than the instruction and here we'll just put 10 now if I wanted to put it in if I wanted to put it in uh, uh, in hex, then I would have to use a, because 10, 10 in hex is 16. Uh, but I, if I just put 10 and I have the radix set at decimal, then this will be interpreted as a decimal. All right. Now we have 10 in in the in, the, in w, and then we want to move uh, w to uh, f, where f is x. Now, since x may not be in the in the common RAM that's mapped every bank, before we do this, we should bank cell. 
x. So we've got the proper number stored in the BSR. All right, so this, this then initializes x. Now later on, or maybe right after this, we set up our loop. And uh, in our loop then, we get, have to give it a label at the top. So we'll, we'll call it, uh, we'll call it, we'll call it uh, for loop a. And then uh, we can write another, we can write an instruction on the same line, or we, a lot of times we'll just leave this sit out there by itself, but it's effectively on the same line as whatever the in next instruction is. And so, uh, and then let's say in that for loop, we're gonna, I don't know, we're gonna, maybe we're gonna blink the LED 10 times or something. So, uh, so what we might very well do, uh, so we'll do for loop A, and then we'll uh, bit set F, uh, uh, um, LATA comma five, and then we'll do a, a call delay, and then we'll bit clear F, LATA five, and then we'll call delay, and then and then. Uh, and then now we'll do our decrement. Uh, oh well, we should have. Uh, I should have done bank cells here. L A T A, and I need another one right here. So I should have put those in. Now we're down here. Now we're going to bank cell. Bank cell X, and then we're going to decrement F, skip on zero, X, comma, F, because we want to actually leave the results in X, not in W. And then we're going to put our branch, BRA or go to, whichever you want, for, for loop A, and then this will be the rest of our program down here. So if we put 10 in X, this loop will execute 10 times, and then it'll on the 10th time through, it'll skip that branch and continue executing these other instructions. So, so I want you to be able to write this. Now, here are the things I want you to understand about this. Uh, I want you to understand that uh, why you have to bank cell, how that there's, for latch A, seven bits of the address are in the instruction, but the other five bits have to be put in the BSR. Now, in this case, latch A, I think, is in bank, uh, maybe bank three. I don't know. I have to look. But uh, so so most of the other five bits are zero, but it's going to be zero, 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 one, one uh, if it's in bank three in the BSR. Remember, the BSR only has five bits. Uh, then you also, when you use this bit set F or bit clear F instructions, you have to specify the three-bit address of the pin you want to affect, uh, or the bit you want to affect. Uh, in a case of latch A, you're actually affecting the flip-flop associated with that pin. In the case of uh, uh, a location like X, you'd just be affecting one of the bits in that uh, random access memory location if you used it on that. Um, okay, and then uh, then our call delay routine, uh, we've looked at those. Uh, we this is this is very much like a function call. We call the subroutine, uh, the subroutine executes, and then it returns uh, control right back to the next instruction after this one. Now, the reason we need to do a bank cell there again, besides the bank cell we did up here, is it's possible that our delay routine could change uh, the BSR. And if it does change the BSR, and in fact it probably will change the BSR, then uh, then we would. Uh, then we wouldn't be pointing to the correct bank and this latch A instruction would fail. And so that would be uh, bad. So we, we need to do that bank cell again. Then, uh, uh, then we call delay again, then we bank cell for X, uh, and then we decrement F, skip on zero, X comma F, leave the result there, and then we branch always to for loop A, and that gets skipped on the 10th time through. All right. So you should understand all those features of that, and you should be able to write this really without any problem. Um, okay, so so that's one. 
and then uh, then the next the next thing we want you to do uh, is number two we want you to be able to uh, exchange X and Y using another register maybe Z or whatever and again you, you could these could have any names but I want you to be able to exchange the contents of X with the contents of Y using uh, the register Z as a temporary storage location now it is possible to do this without using Z but uh, it's a little bit complicated and involves using the exclusive OR instruction and so we won't necessarily mess with that but anyway okay so so the first thing we have to do is we have to set this up as well so we, somewhere we have to declare X and Y as variables and we they have to have it you know correct addresses located in in random access memory as well as Z let's say in this case we put them we put them in the we'll put them in the common ran at say 70 71 and 72 so when we put them in common RAM uh, that those 16 values 70 through 7f are actually mapped to every bank so uh, we don't have to mess with the BSR or whatever the BSR is set at it's still going to work just fine so uh, so that's a nice feature and we'll we'll take advantage of that okay so uh, so we still have to set them up so what we'll do is we'll MOV literal to W let's say we want to put uh, let's say we want to put uh, 25 in X and uh, 100 in Y so we'll move and we'll do uh, we'll, we'll make this decimal 25 so we'll just write 25 and then we'll MOV uh, W to F X we don't need that second operand with the WF instruction we don't need it with the literal instruction either and then we'll move literal to W 100 decimal again and we'll move W to F Y and again because we're using the common RAM we don't have to bank sell these okay so that's good so that's the setup so we did that somewhere and now later in the program we want to switch them so it's so here's where we then we so now we we won't have to use bank cell again for the same reason so this just makes it a little bit shorter so the first thing we would do is move uh, move F so and we'll put X here so we take X and we move the contents of X into W but here we do have a second operand we have to put W there otherwise the contents will default to F and we'll, we'll, we'll move the contents right back into X won't change a thing but we will set the zero bit if X is zero which of course in this case it's not so it won't really do anything so but we have to put this W and then we can move W to F and we can put what was in X into Z so now X W and Z all have the value 25 we didn't erase the value in X we didn't erase the value in Z with this we just moved it to Z I'm uh, sorry we didn't erase the value in W with this we just we just moved it to Z we did overwrite whatever happened to be in Z but since we never initialized Z all it had was some random value that it powered up with so we don't really care about that anyway um, but we could have cleared it potentially uh, now that puts X in the so now X still has 25 but so does Z and for the moment so does W so now what we're going to do is take Y and we're going to move F Y to W and then we're going to uh, uh, move the value of Y which is 100 now it's in Y and, and also in W now we're going to move that to X we'll use the MOVWF to X no second operand required on the MOVWF instruction so now X equals 100 we'll put that in a little comment here right now it equals 25 but now it equals 100 now we're going to move F 
z comma w put z into w which is 25 so now so right now before we do this w has 100 in it but when we do this it's going to have 25 and then we're going to move w to f x sorry uh, y uh, and that'll put 25 into y and now we have so then y is going to equal 25 right now y equals 100 up there okay so you can't quite see it all so forget that that was bad okay so so this is this is all it takes to, to switch the contents but we do use z we save x into z because when we write x we destroyed the 25 so if we hadn't saved it that 25 would be gone and then here uh, we take what we saved in z put it into w and then we write it into y so we save x into z move y into x restore z uh, into into uh, put z into y okay and these should all be comments here all right now the other the other things that we're going to do and you've all and and i may not ask you all these but but i'm going to ask you some subset of these maybe or maybe all of them who knows so three you need to be able to configure a register So what this what this means, like let's say you wanted to configure one of the Tris registers. Let's say we wanted to do Tris C, and we wanted every every even pin as input, every odd pin as output. So <clears throat> how would you do this? How would you how would you make Tris C set up for every even pin as an input and every odd pin as an output? Well, let's dr let's draw it. And I think it's always helpful to draw it out. At least when you're dealing with eight bit micros, it's it's fine because you can do it without you know killing yourself. When you have thirty two bit registers, it's a little more of a pain to do this. Okay, there's all eight bits. This is bit zero. This is bit seven. So if we want every even bit an input, then that means we want a one for zero, a one for two, a one for four, and a one for six. And if we want all the odd pins to be outputs, then for one, three, five, and seven, we want ones. I'm sorry, uh, zeros, my bad. So now here's the bit pattern, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. So in hex, what is that? Or moreover, if you wanted to do, a, if you wanted to do the shifting, you have four things. It's probably easier to just to set this up in hex. So 1, 2, 3, 4. So we're going to divide it into two nibbles, and we'll write the hex digit for each one. So that's, a, that's a hex 5. So we write 0, x, 5, 5. So now, in order to make this work, we have to do uh, MOV literal to W, 0x55, and then the next instruction would be MOV W to F, TR Tris uh, C. And obviously we'd have to bank cell uh, Tris C. So these would be our instructions. That first, that next, and that last. All right, and then the other things that, that we would do, uh, we would we would pull uh, and then uh, and then we would configure.
we'd pull on a bit like like you do when you check uh, the the bit uh, for uh, say the uh, the um, for the interrupt flag when we when we wrote the uh, the delay module uh, for just waiting on timer zero to time out not using interrupts but just uh, looking at the interrupt flag until it was set to a one and then we knew that uh, that that meant that the uh, that that timer zero had overflowed so we would clear that bit and we would go back and we'd uh, return from that subroutine and then uh, that would be our delay routine. Uh, we did that in lab two. Uh, so, so here we now have uh, these last couple of things. And then configure a GPIO, in, GPIO pin as an input. So that's, that's what you had to do to set up uh, your uh, RB7 push button input. And generally that involves several steps. Uh, one, you have to correctly set the TRIS bit, the TRIS X bit, whatever that is, to a one and then you have to clear the ANCEL bit ANCEL X bit to a zero and then in order to read that you have to read with uh, the port X so you have to use the, the port address to read the bit you can't you can't read it you can't read an input with the latch command okay I think I'm going to stop here and uh, and we'll we'll pick up then on Thursday and then on the 29th which uh, is uh, a week from today we'll have the the test so next next Tuesday and I I will have a uh, Let's see, where's my thing? Oops, shit, meant to do this. I will, uh, let me switch the cameras real quick. So I will, I will have a, uh, I'll do a help session before the test. Uh, you could probably just come to office hours on Monday. Uh, that'll probably be the easiest time. And I'll, 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 I'll devote most of those office hours to uh, to your test. Um, so uh, next Monday at at noon, uh, and uh, that link is uh, on at the very it's on the banner part of your blackboard for the course. All right. Um, so if you have any questions, um, you can check in for sure then, uh, or you can uh, you can email me or text me, and I'll try and respond. Um, Otherwise, we'll see you later.